Hey guys, Matt here, and today we're going to start uh, perhaps a series of psalms. We'll see how it goes, uh, but we're going to start with Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is one of my favorite psalms, and it is a psalm that I got to preach in the Philippines recently, and I have really fallen in love with the psalms, and I think they're the psalms are often... Uh, read inaccurately and if you're like me you may have in the past or maybe even presently you read the Psalms and you read them as if they're about you or maybe you want to be historically accurate and you read them as if it's all about David and it's interesting because I think we see a clue who the Psalms are all about in Luke 24. Jesus says something interesting. In fact, when you think of Jesus preaching in the synagogues, what was he using? Well, he was using the Old Testament, right? They didn't have the Gospel of John or any epistles written at that point, right? So Jesus was preaching. He was trying to convince people, I'm the Christ, and he was showing them in the Old Testament, just like the apostles did. Look what happened in, in Acts after Pentecost. What did they do? They started quoting the Old Testament like crazy, showing that it was all pointing to Christ. And Jesus makes this point really clear in Luke 24. It's the road to Emmaus, right? After Jesus died, they didn't know he resurrected. And there's two apostles, two disciples rather, and not one of the twelve. And they're sad because they crucified the Lord and Jesus shows up and he has this dialogue with them and he asks them why they're so sad. Well, he knows why they're so sad, right? But he goes on in Luke 24, verse 25, and he says something significant, very significant. He says, O foolish and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What's he hinting at here? All the prophets, they were pointing to me. Verse 26, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? We see this in Hebrews 2. How does Jesus enter into his glory? By suffering and dying for our sins. Verse 27, And beginning with Moses, that's the law, the first five books in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And I don't know about you, but I would have loved to be there on that day. Jesus takes the two disciples who are sad, who shouldn't be sad, they should be rejoicing. He brings them back and he says, that was about me, that was pointing to me, that was pointing to me, because all of the law and the prophets was pointing to Jesus, was written about Jesus. In fact, all scripture is written by Jesus, for Jesus, through Jesus, about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So we're getting a hint for what, what are the Psalms really about. Well, they're not really written for me. They're not really written about King David. He's just a shadow. He's just a picture pointing to the Christ. He goes on in Luke 24, verse 44, And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me... In the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms, you could, you could say the writings, the poetic portion of the Old Testament, all that was written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophet, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. What's he saying here? He's saying it's all about me, guys. He tells this to the Pharisees in John 5. He says in John 5, verse 39, he says, You search the Scriptures... Because you think that in them you find eternal life. But they are bearing witness about me. All of the Old Testament is bearing witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you would be saved. He goes on in verse 46 of John 4 and he says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. When Moses was penning the law, the first five books in the Bible, he knew he was writing about someone else. He knew he was writing about the Christ. So, back to Psalm 1. Psalm 1 goes like this. Blessed is the man. Alright, 
Talking about the man. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but, transition, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree, planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all, in all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so. They're like chafe in the wind that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. All right, so let's have a little fun here because if you're like me, you've read this psalm like this. Blessed is the man, that's me, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands not. I don't do that. Get to the good part. I delight in the law of the Lord. That's me. I meditate on it day and night. Me, me, me. I'm like a tree planted by streams of water. I bear fruit and I, I prosper in everything I do. And the fact is, we know that's not, that's not true, right? It's not really written about me. It's not really written about King David. Because I don't meditate on the law day and night. I don't prosper in everything I do. And neither do you. Neither did King David, by the way. If King David meditated on the law day and night and prospered in all he did, he would never met Bathsheba. Correct? Correct. So, blessed is the man. Who's the man? Well, it's Jesus. O foolish and slow to believe all that the law and the prophets and the Psalms said about me. It's all about the Christ. So he comes out and he says in verse 1, Blessed is the man. This man is blessed. He's different. Blessed is the man. And then he does, the, the psalmster, the psalmist rather, does something interesting. And this is something that we see in, in poetic language a lot, frequently. He doesn't describe the man. He describes who the man isn't. He describes the antithesis of the blessed man. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. This is interesting. You want to know who the blessed man is? Let me start by telling you who he's not. He doesn't walk in sin. He doesn't stand in sin. He doesn't sit in it. He has nothing to do with it. Now, the author, remember this is poetry, the author writing this poem, this psalm, he's not describing three different groups of sinners here. Ones that walk in wickedness, one that stands in the way of sinners, or, or, or this other group over here who sits in the seat of scoffers. He's not. He's not describing three levels of sin. He's describing someone who all they do is sin. And the truth is, if we want to find our place in this psalm, pre-Christ, before this blessed man, this is where we all would be. In fact, if you were a Jew in the first century, or any century, at, the, at this time when it's written, if you were a Jew, you would read this and you would think, hmm, this person, this blessed man, isn't like this group of people. This group of people walks, stands, and sits in sin. And if you were a good Jew, and if you knew the law, which most Jews did, even the Jews that weren't saved, which is the majority of them, We'll get to that in a minute. You might think of one of the bread and butter passages for Judaism, and it's Deuteronomy 6. And De Deuteronomy 6 goes like this. Now this is the commandment, the statute, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going to possess. Not talking about the promised land, that's just the picture. The true land that we're supposed to possess is heaven. It's the new Jerusalem. It's pointing to heaven. That you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's sons, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Again, he's saying keep the commandments and your days will be long. He's not saying you're going to live to be 139. He's talking about eternity. He's talking about keep the law and you'll enter into eternity. 
There's a problem with this. We'll get to that in a moment. Verse 3, Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that's the law, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing of milk and honey. Again, pointing to the new Jerusalem. Hear, O Israel, verse 4, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. There's a problem with that. We'll get to that in a moment. Now listen to this. Listen to how Moses writes, verse 7. He says, You shall teach them, talking about the law, you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you... Listen to this. Kind of sounds, sounds a little bit like Psalm 1. You will talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. What's he saying? All the time. But there's a problem. The Jews couldn't do this. The Jews never did this. In fact, most of the Jews never had salvation. Were they God's chosen people? They were. Yep. Did God make a covenant with them? He did, but they never kept the covenant. God never breaks his covenant, but the Jews did all of the time. This was all God's design, God's plan. Why? You can't do this. You can't love the Lord your God with all your heart. You can't teach your children when you sit down, when you walk up, when you rise up, when you walk down the way. Why? Well, Moses tells us in Deuteronomy 29, verse 4, But to this day the Lord your God has not given you a heart to understand, eyes to see, or ears to hear. You can't follow the covenant. You can't follow the law, Israel, because I didn't create you to. This is highly significant. Very few Jews, there was a remnant, who were always saved, and they were saved by faith. They were not saved by keeping the law. There's no such thing as a law keeper until the blessed man. So what did they need? Well, in Deuteronomy 30, it talks about the Lord God will circumcise your heart. They needed circumcised hearts. They needed someone who would be a covenant keeper. Enter the blessed man. He doesn't walk in sin. He doesn't stand in sin. He doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. He's describing everyone except the blessed man. Uh, think of an auditorium of people sitting there. And let's just say God's on the stage. And they're sitting there with buckets of popcorn, big things of coke, and they're scoffing at God. They're laughing at Him. This is the human condition. Uh, Paul covers this quite well in Romans 3. In Romans 3, he says some pretty harsh language. And by the way, Romans 3, verse 10 through 18, it's a conglomeration mostly of Psalms. He says this, None are righteous, no, not one. None, no one seeks after God, no one understands. All have turned aside and together and become worthless. None seek after God, all are worthless. Their throat, it's an open grave. Think about an open grave with a dead body, rotting corpse, and Mos or, uh, Paul, rather, quoting the psalmster, says, This is you. This is the human condition of Jew and Gentile alike. Your mouth, your throat, it's like an open grave. It's that offensive to God. It's like the scent of a dead corpse coming out of your mouth. Why? Because no one seeks after God. You're born in sin. Ever since the fall in the garden, this is the condition. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. You have venom, poisonous venom coming from you. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet, swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The psalmster is saying the blessed man isn't like any of these, but you are. Everyone else is. So if we wanted to be accurate before Christ, this is where all of us would be. But not the blessed man, verse 2. But his, the blessed man, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Now think of this. 
You and I don't meditate on the law day and night. We don't. No one does. Israel couldn't follow the law. They were supposed to. They were supposed to teach their children. But there's a problem. They didn't have a heart to. They needed a changed heart. They needed a law-keeping king. Moses prophesies about this king in Deuteronomy 17. The perfect king, he's going to come. He's always going to keep a copy of the law with him. He's going to do it. And he's going to fear the Lord. Who does that? It's the blessed man. It's Jesus. He's the law keeper. Uh, think about in Matthew 4 when the only story, by the way, the only story in all of the Bible about Jesus' childhood. People often wonder about Jesus' childhood. They make up stories and they hear stories and he had a pet bird and the bird died and he healed the bird and all of this stuff that's not in the Bible. If God wants us to know it, he'll tell us in the Bible. Only one story of Jesus' youth, 12 years old, left behind by his parents. He's in the temple and he's sitting with the Pharisees and the priests, the leaders, and what's he discussing with them? He's discussing the law. Why? Because he delights in the law. He meditates on the law. He knows the law so well that they marvel. He's only 12. That's why that story's in the Bible. It's saying that one who's going to keep the law, that one in Psalm 1 who delights in the law, it's this kid who's 12 years old. It's pointing to Christ's perfection. Think of uh, when Jesus was in the desert being tempted, right? Matthew 3, 15, 16, he gets baptized and the Spirit drives him to the desert. 40 days he fasts. The enemy comes at the end of his fast when he's weakest, he's lonely, he's tired, he's hungry, and the enemy tempts him. And what does Jesus do to avoid falling into temptation? He quotes scripture to the enemy. But what does he quote? Well, he quotes Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8. In other words, he quotes the law. Why? Because he delights in the law. He meditates on it day and night. Because he delights in the law, because he meditates in the law, he fulfills the law. Matthew 5, 17, do not think I have come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it. He's the fulfiller of the law. Okay, so he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, he doesn't stand in the, in the way of the sinners, he doesn't sit in the seat of the scoffers, but this one, this blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night, constantly. And he's the only one who ever has will meditate on the law. He's the only one. So, what do we do with that? Well, if I want to not be in group one, if I, if I don't want to walk in sin, stand in sin, sit in the seat of the scoffer, I better be in this blessed man. I better be in him. I want to be in the law keeper. In fact, a remarkable thing happens when I'm in the law keeper. Paul uses the term in Christ throughout Scripture. In Christ, through Christ. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. What happens if there's a perfect law keeper, this blessed man, Jesus, and Jesus lives inside of me, Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory, what does that mean regarding the law? Well, it's a powerful, powerful picture here. Here's what uh, Paul says in Romans 8.4. He says, well, I'll just read from verse 2. He says, I'll read from verse 1. There, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ, in Christ Jesus, from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He who knew sin, he who knew no sin, became sin, right? He wasn't a sinner, but he was in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Why? Verse 4. Listen to this. 
This is powerful. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The righteous requirement of the law. What was God's righteous requirement of the law? Simple. It was perfection. Why was most of Israel not saved? She didn't have a heart to follow God. She could never keep the law. Neither could you or I. There's only one person who delights in the law, who meditates in the law, who fulfills the law. It's Jesus. And when Christ is in you, and you're in Christ, do you know that God the Father looks down and he sees you as a perfect Ten Commandment keeper? Why? Because you're in the one who kept the commandments perfectly and he's in you. That's the power of the blessed man. That's the power of being in Christ. The righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in you. Paul called the law a ministry of death. It was. No one could keep the law except this one. So, how do I fit in this psalm? Well, I'm just a sinner. But if I'm in the blessed man, I'm a law keeper by faith. By faith in the one who kept the law. Let's go on. Verse 3. He, the blessed man, he's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. Now, I'd like to say that's me and so would you, but it's not because we don't prosper in everything we do. We don't yield fruit constantly, all the time, perfectly. There's only one person who does this. It's Jesus. He's like a tree. He's planted by streams of water. So the picture is, after the fall in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden, right? And there is a dry, arid, hard land that they're supposed to bear fruit. Well, how do you do it? Hmm. Someone better come and be fruitful and multiply. Someone better come and fulfill Genesis 1.28 because it's not going to be Adam and Eve and the story goes on and progresses and it's not going to be Noah and it's not going to be Abraham and it's not going to be Isaac, it's not going to be Jacob, it's not going to be David. It's going to be the blessed man. It's going to be the one who comes and keeps the law and he is going to be fruitful. He's like a tree. He's like a tree planted intentionally by the Father in the middle of a dry, hard sinful ground, but it's okay. Why is it okay? Because there's a stream. There's a stream hewn by the hand of God that feeds Jesus. In fact, you could say there's a stream of living water. So great is this connection between Jesus and his Father that his Father's always feeding him streams of living water, right? Jesus is always in communion with the Father. Mark 1, Mark 2, rising while it was still dark, he went to a desolate place and he prayed. He meditates on the law constantly and he prays to the Father constantly. In fact, this is uh, one of the uh, things you'll see repeated in the Psalms. You'll see the suffering servant. You'll see him suffering for sins, though not his own. You'll see his connection with the Father, his desperate connection with the Father. It's not David crying out, it's Jesus crying out to Father God. And you'll see Father God, Yahweh, having something called steadfast love for Jesus. His connection is so great with the Father that the Father takes him as a tree, plants him in the middle of a sinful nation, a sinful world, and he feeds him constantly. They're in constant communion. Well, so much is he fed by streams of living water that he bears fruit all the time. Everything he does prospers. His leaves never wither. Death couldn't hold him. The enemy couldn't keep him. Everything he does, he prospers perfectly. So, in John 15, when Jesus comes out and he says something significant, John 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine. The true vine? Why does he say the true vine? Because every other vine was false? Well, kind of, but more than that. 
He's representing, he's the true Israel of God. He's the true vine. Israel was always called a bad vine. You see it in Ezekiel. You see it in Hosea. Hosea 10.1. Yahweh says, you are a luxuriant vine. Well, that sounds great. Which bears fruit. And then you take your fruit and you give it to the Baals. The more fruit you have, the more altars you build to false gods. Israel was a bad vine. She didn't have a heart to follow. She needed someone who would come and be fruitful and multiply. She needed someone who would come and change her heart. She needed the true vine. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. I am the true vine. Stay in me. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, not just adequate fruit, not just a little fruit. He who abides in me bears much fruit. Why? Because I'm like a tree planted by streams of living water. That's why. Right? I'm the blessed man. I'm the one who fulfills the law. I'm the one who fulfills Genesis 1.28. I'm the one who's fruitful and multiplies. I'm the true vine. Abide in me. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He goes on. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and it withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. People who say they're in Christ but don't bear fruit end up going to hell. That's what that's saying. Verse 7, if, if, qualifying uh, word there, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciple. What do we do with that? Well, if I'm in the blessed man, I'm in the law keeper, and the law keeper's in me. I'm seen as a law keeper. If I'm in the one who's like a tree, if I'm in the one who fulfills Genesis 1.28, if I'm in the one who's fruitful and multiplies, if I'm in the one who's the true vine, I'm going to bear fruit. How do I find myself in this psalm? It's easy. I must, I must not be in the first group. I must be in the blessed man. How am I considered the temple of the living God? Because I'm in the temple, Jesus. Revelation 21, 22. How is it that I'm in, uh, how is it that I'm holy and beloved, holy and blameless? Because I'm in the holy and blameless one, Jesus, the blessed man. How is it that I'm the Israel of God, that I'm in Israel now? That there's no longer Jew or Gentile. We're all spiritual Israel because we're in the Israel of God, Jesus. Isaiah 49, 3. Right? And on and on and on. We must be in the blessed man. And if we're in him, we too will bear fruit. John 7. Jesus stands up at the uh, uh, festival of booths. And he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. And out of him will come streams of living water. How can streams of living water come from us? Because they first came to him. Because it's first all about Jesus. He's like a tree planted by streams of living water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. Five beautiful lines describing Jesus. He's like a tree, planted, prospers, never withers. And then, what does the author do in verse 4? Well, he describes the wicked. What does he say? The wicked are not so. That's it. Here's Jesus. The wicked, no, they're not like that at all. In fact, they're like chaff that the wind drives away. I'm sure you know this, but just in case someone doesn't who's watching this, uh, the, the analogy of chaff and, and wheat, what, what the analogy is, is the farmer throws up the, the, the wheat, God, throwing up all those who are in the world, and the true wheat, the true believer, falls down into his hands, and the false believers, the chaff, blows away. The wicked, they're not so, they're like chafe that the wind drives away, only that's not the end of it. It doesn't end there for the wicked. They don't just blow away, they've got bigger problems. Verse 5, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. 
The wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Why can't they stand? It's appointed once for a man to die, and then the judgment. I think that's Hebrews 9.26, 9.27. What's going to happen? Well, we're all going to face the judgment, but the wicked, those who sit and scoff at God, those who walk in sin, those who reject Jesus Christ, when that day comes, they will not be able to stand in the seat of judgment. Why? Because they stood in sin. Right? Because they stood in sin, they cannot stand before Him. The wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. It's appointed once for man to die, and then the judgment. So here's the scene. The wicked man dies, and God says, Okay, let me roll out my my." plan for you. Let me let me roll out my the way I'm going to judge you here. Did you keep the law? By the way, before you answer, did you keep the law perfectly? And the sinner realizes that he cannot stand because God's requirement is perfection. And he sent the one who fulfilled that requirement. His name is Jesus. And if people reject Jesus, they're like chafe that blows away in the wind, they're like the wicked that cannot stand in the seat of judgment. They cannot. Verse 6, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. How does he know the way of the righteous? Because he predestines everyone who comes into him. Right? He, ha he has foreknowledge. He pre those who he knows, he predestines. All of us who are in Christ were predestined to do so, to be so, to be there before the foundation of the world. In John 10, uh, it says, Jesus, my sheep hear my voice, my sheep, my true sheep, not the goats, my sheep hear my voice, that's the righteous ones, my sheep hear my voice, and they do something. They follow me. And I acknowledge something. I know them in a saving way. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I know them and I give them something. I give them eternal life. I recognize them. They're now in my son. They're now in the perfect one. They're now righteous because they're in the righteous one. They're now in the righteous one. They're in the blessed man and he's in them. So I know them. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous but the way of the wicked will perish. Isn't that something? That was a real quick uh, tour through Psalm 1. What we see in Psalm 1 is there's a blessed man. He's not like anyone else. Everyone else has fallen. Everyone else has sinned. None are good. No, not one. None seek after God. There's no such thing as a seeker of God. Right? But this one, this blessed man, delights in the law so much. He meditates on the law so much. He knows it so well that he does it perfectly. You could say he fulfills it. In fact, he's like a tree. He's fruitful in everything he does. So where must we be? We must be in the blessed man. Psalm 1 isn't about me. I don't prosper in everything I do. I don't delight in the law. It's not about you because you don't either. And it's not about King David. Psalm 1 is about Jesus. And we see before we start all, any other psalm in the book of Psalms, we see we must be in the blessed man. Otherwise, we, like the sinner, will not be able to stand in the seat of judgment. Must, must, must be in Christ by faith. And if we are, there will be fruit. Many people... The wheat and the chafe grow together. Many people claim the name of Christ. They say they're a Christian. How do you know a Christian? You know a Christian by his fruit. How do you know if someone's saved? By their fruit and the fact that they stay saved. They don't fall away. We must be in the blessed man. Peace.